Okay, welcome everyone to CPEN's Equity in Behavioral Health webinar. Uh, my name is Mihei Jung, and I'm the Community Advocacy Director at CPEN. Welcome everyone. Um, just the housekeeping for all of you, um, that this is a, a learning environment, and our presenter is a resource to you. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please put your questions in a box and it will be monitored. Before we get started, um, please click the raise hand icon if you can hear me. We're doing a little bit of a sound check. So please click the raise hand icon. Oh, we are good to go, great. Um, and if we get disconnected, please dial back in with the same link and login information. And again, don't be afraid to ask questions. Um, so the bulk of our presentation today will be about 40 minutes and we'll have the last 15 minutes to do a Q&A. You have all joined the webinar in listen only mode and you're muted and the webinar will be recorded. And after the webinar is completed, CPEN will be sending out slides, handouts, and a recording of this webinar tomorrow. Okay, next slide. Again, my name is Mihei Jung, and I'm the Community Advocacy Director at CPEN. Next slide. Great. So CPEN started our work in mental health in 2012 when we started working in the strategic plan to reduce mental health disparities for the California Reducing Disparities Project. It's often referred as a CRDP. And the CRDP project was launched in 2009 as a core component of California's Mental Health Services Act, Prop 63. And the CRDP focuses on five populations, including African Americans, API, Latino um, and LGBTQ communities, as well as Native American communities, and it provides community-driven recommendations to reduce mental health disparities through policy change and program development. And the strategic plan that we worked on was done alongside our partners rep that represent really diverse populations in California, and this plan is community-driven and community-authored document that provides a roadmap and a blueprint for reducing mental health disparities in unserved, underserved, and inappropriately served communities of California. So if you'd like to learn more about the California Reducing Disparities Project, please tune into our webinar on October 26th. And fast forwarding to 2016, um, CPEN launched the Behavioral Health Equity Collaborative, which is statewide, in order to provide more investment into appropriate and quality mental health services through bringing a community voice to state policymaking. This collaborative includes state and local organizations that each represent a different community, including immigrant, refugee, youth, LGBTQ, and people of color. So the collaborative engages in policy change efforts through policy development, advocacy with state agencies and the legislature, and of course, we do capacity building. And third, with the Health Integration Forum, which convened from 2017 to 2018, CPEN was able to engage partners working in the areas of oral and behavioral health in Los Angeles. So with this, we had the opportunity to engage folks working in these two systems of care, which are very marginalized from the traditional healthcare delivery system. Next slide. Um, so these are some of the recent reports that we produced in 2018. Feel free to download them from this slide. These reports include recommendations to improve mental health systems of, of um, mental health systems of care for communities of color in California. And CPEN is especially thankful to all our community partners who lifted up their programs, case studies, issues, and lessons learned in the production of these reports. And they're also available on our website. Next slide. And here's some fun pictures for you all. <laughs> here's some of the community advocacy work that we've done with the Behavioral Health Equity Collaborative. As I've mentioned before, 
um, our collaborative was formed in 2016 to bring community voices to improving mental health systems in California. We meet monthly over video conference and meet in person twice a year, one in the Bay Area and one in Southern California. Um, in June of 2018, uh, Behavioral Health Equity Collaborative members visited Sacramento and successfully advocated for more investment in immigrant and refugee communities to increase access to mental health services. We also collaborated with local organizations such as Fathers and Families of San Joaquin, Victor on the Right, to ensure their concerns are elevated in statewide policymaking. Um, and CPEN is, of course, part of the collaborative. So with all of our members and partners, we learn together on how to navigate this incredibly complex system, and we build power together, and we continue to center the voices of our communities at the core of policy change to push for California's mental health systems that work for all people. So, okay, I'm really excited to pass it over to my colleague, Carolina, who will essentially be giving you um, California's Public Mental Health System 101. So, next slide. Great, thank you, Mihe, for that great overview. And thank you all for taking the time to be on this webinar with us today. My name is Carolina Vai, and I am the Senior Policy Associate with the California Pan-Ethnic Health Network. I'm based here in the LA office where I lead our re local research and advocacy and mental health. Um, I'm also a trained social worker with a history and direct service. So uh, prior to CPEN, I was an advocate for high-risk pregnant and postpartum women dependent on the county mental health system. So I am really excited to bring my knowledge of mental health policy 101 with my experience on the front lines of referral navigation. Um, here is a little snapshot of our agenda for today. We will talk about the funding and oversight structure in public mental health services. We won't talk about every single law that has impacted our public mental health system, but we will talk about four important laws. Um, we'll also dive into the spectrum of services that are available and how we can navigate referrals and understand people's mental health rights. Next slide. So just a little poll to check in with folks who are on the call. Um, if you could go ahead and please select one of these options in response to this question. How familiar are you with navigating the public mental health system? Very familiar, somewhat familiar, and not familiar. And then we will check in at the end. Great, next slide. Awesome. So why public mental health services in communities of color? Why is this issue important? Uh, the first important thing to note about the relationship between communities of color and public mental health services is that there is a long history of inequity. As all of you know, extensive research and experience has shown that communities of color have been historically unserved, underserved, or inappropriately served by California's public mental health system. I will go into greater detail about what this exactly means to be unserved, underserved, or inappropriately served. Uh, but for example, approximately 4% of adults here in California are diagnosed and living with a serious mental illness, but Latino, African Americans, Native Americans, and multiracial adults have much higher rates of serious mental illness than their white counterparts. Um, and this does not account for those communities of color who may need public mental health services, but do not necessarily have a serious mental illness. Uh, the second important thing to note about our experience with public mental health services is that health coverage and access alone do not guarantee a reduction in disparities or necessarily improve health outcomes. Quality of care and the cultural and linguistic appropriateness of care are also critical components of ensuring health equity. Simply put, communities of color will not return for their appointments if these parts are not in place. Um, and this is especially true in California, where the majority of resident, residents are from communities of color and over 200 different languages are spoken. Next slide. All right, so just a word about terminology. Um, sometimes we will hear uh, organizations refer to their uh, clients as patients or consumers. Um, but you will most likely hear a mental health organization refer to any person for services, any person you refer for services as a client. Uh, the word client was adopted by the mental health field as a rejection of the term patient. 
patient is typically used as a medical term and continues to be used in hospital and clinic settings. Advocacy organizations such as CPEN may refer to people as consumers as well. What's important to note is that when you're interacting with public mental health services, like the county mental health system, you will most likely refer to people, hear people refer to them as clients. And so for the purposes of this presentation, we will move forward with the term client. There isn't a rule in place that requires you to use either client, patient, or consumer in your practice, but it's important to note. Next slide. Okay, so carve out. Carve out, you're gonna hear this fancy term a lot when we're talking about public mental health services. Uh, in California, public mental health services are a carve out, and this means that public mental health services are simply offered through a separate system. It means that public mental health services are offered by county mental health plans. Uh, the second important thing that you should know about carve out is that it ensures and makes public mental health services for seriously mentally ill adults and children with severe emotional disturbances and entitlements. Every county has a mental health plan. The mental health plan in your county is responsible for providing or arranging what we call specialty mental health services for people who have serious mental illness or severe emotional disturbance, who also have Medi-Cal in their county. So what does this actually mean? What does carve-out actually mean? It means that instead of the state, counties are primarily in charge of design, designing and administering mental health programs and services. So in California, we have about 58 different counties, and that means we have 58 different mental health systems in California. And to make matters even more complicated, some counties might provide all the services themselves, while other counties may contract out their services to community-based organizations. Next slide. So we will talk more about this, but the carve-out system was supported by a law called the 1915B waiver. So this is another way to understand what carve-out means. It means that public mental health services are managed at the county level by the county mental health plan. And while it is not a perfect system, there is a lot of research indicating the benefits of the carve-out system. And one of the major ones is that counties can conduct local assessments and design local programming based on the unique needs of their communities. And this is especially important in the context of communities of color, an extremely diverse group county by county. Next slide. Okay, so here's just a snapshot of the spending on public mental health services. This does not include mental health services that are paid for by private insurance, just a note. Um, as you can see, there are many funding sources for public mental health, but what I'd like to bring your attention to is three parts of this pie. So let's start at the dark orange here. You'll see the term FFP, which stands for Federal Financial Participation. And FFP, or Federal Financial Participation, indicated here shows that it's the greatest portion of mental health services that are paid for by Medicaid, also known as Medi-Cal here in California. And what's important for you to know is that while it is the biggest source of, funding, of spending on public mental health services, it can only pay for the services of people who are eligible for Medi-Cal. In other words, public mental health services cannot use Medi-Cal to pay for the mental health services of people who are ineligible for Medi-Cal. All right, so drawing your attention to the light blue sliver on the top right, that is the second biggest pot of funding, which is known as the Mental Health Services Act. The Mental Health Services Act is a source of funding and regulation, and I'll talk more about that later from a funding perspective, but this source of revenue is generated by a 1% tax on millionaires. One, thing impo one important thing to note here is that the Mental Health Services Act is not restricted to people who are eligible for Medi-Cal. Okay, so bringing your eyes down to the left light orange, the third biggest funding source here, um, which is realignment. Uh, realignment dollars, they're, they're very flexible public mental health dollars, and we can use realignment as a match to draw down federal Medicaid dollars or to cover the costs of people who are ineligible for Medi-Cal. So it can go both ways. All right, next slide. All right, so laws. 
Um, we've talked a little bit about what carve out means, the oversight, oversight structure of that, and some of the preferred terminology. Uh, and before we dig into the referral system, I want to give a very brief overview of four important laws that have a huge impact on the structure of our mental health system. We've been through a lot of changes in responsibility, but what you should know is that the overall trend has been an increased responsibility of counties to provide these services. Right, so next slide. So uh, county mental health plans and the 1915B waivers of 1995 and 1997, um, you don't have to get too worried about what 1915B means. It's simply where um, it is in the code book, the number in the code book. Um, but California was granted a waiver, which is, called, which is a permission, in both 1995 and 1997. And it's called 1950B, as I mentioned, because it's where it falls in the code book of regulation. Um, in California, we have all sorts of mental health laws. Um, and when we want to do something differently in our Medi-Cal program, we have to seek a waiver. And a waiver, for your knowledge, is a document that asks for permission from the federal government to exempt yourself from a Medi-Cal rule. It's really just what we do if we want to do something different. And so under, under the 1915B waiver, California was granted permission by the federal government to allow public mental health services to be delivered by individual counties rather than the state. And so in other words, the 1915B waiver helped our system become a carve-out. Um, like I mentioned in the previous carve-out slide, counties are therefore responsible for providing mental health care to all individuals with Medi-Cal, particularly those with serious mental illness or serious emotional disturbance. It is what we call an entitlement program for people. An entitlement program is a government program that guarantees certain benefits to a particular group or segment of the population. And so in California, the 1915B waiver helped make public mental health services an entitlement program for adults with serious mental illness and children with severe emotional disturbance. These people are entitled to what we call specialty mental health services. They're entitled to special mental health services. And the 1915B waiver continues to be the law of the land today. Um, it does expire in 2020, uh, so this is an important opportunity to think about what we want to improve in our 1915B waiver. Um, there are some positive and negative things about this waiver that you should know about as advocates. Um, one major positive thing about the impact of, the, of this law is that we can actually measure the quality of services provided to communities of color. We can measure language access, timeliness, right? Are people getting services when they need them? And so on. These are really crucial areas of evaluation when we're thinking about how to reduce mental health disparities in communities of color. But at the same time, some of the concerns about this waiver is that the county mental health plans have actually struggled to meet these standards, right? They've struggled to provide adequate language access. They provide, they've struggled to provide services in a timely manner and they struggle to track quality overall. So quality, timeliness, timeliness and language, these are all major disparities that continue to affect communities of color. All right, so next slide. So this is just another way to understand who qualifies for this entitlement program that we call specialty mental health services. What is the exact criteria? Uh, we've talked about children with se severe emotional disturbances or and adults with serious mental illness as being entitled to these services, but these are the specific criteria that they must meet to qualify for the, for the program and is what makes the 19, 1915B waiver possible. Okay, so specialty mental health services are for people who have access to Medi-Cal, who meet medical necessity criteria, who have a diagnosis, and who show significant impairment or probability of significant deterioration, such that intervention will diminish impairment or prevent further deterioration. But what's important for you to know is that a clinician, typically a licensed professional, will make this determination when the client receives what we call their mental health assessment. If you are not in the mental health field directly, it is not your job or scope of practice to make this determination. That said, if a person you're working with shares that they have a mental health diagnosis, 
this is a good indication that they may be entitled to specialty mental health services. That's why a successful, a successful referral is so important. Next slide. So these are just some examples of the types of specialty mental health services that are provided. Um, and what's important to note really is that specialty mental health services are intensive services for people with more severe needs. Next slide. Okay, so let's talk about realignment. We just covered the 1915B waiver, which made an entitlement program for certain populations. Um, and it made sure <clears throat> that people who were experiencing more severe symptoms were entitled to services. Next slide. The second important law you should know about is the Realignment Act of 1991. Uh, realignment simply means to reorganize something. Okay, so the Realignment Act of 1991 shifted power over the administration and funding of health and social services, including mental health, from the state to counties. Realignment granted counties even greater flexibility in the spending of funds for both public mental health and safety net services. And every time we shift responsibility from the state to the county, we have to put money towards it. So to support this realignment, this reorganization, the state moved funding, dedicated tax revenues from the sales tax and vehicle license fees directly to counties. From an equity perspective, realignment also required county mental health plans to provide mental health services, not only for people with Medi-Cal, but also for certain types of uninsured populations. However, only to the extent that resources were available. So the extent to which resources are available, it's kind of a vague statement. What does this actually mean? It's hard to say. So while counties have greater flexibility and control over their spending, it is also up to them to decide how they spend their funds on people who are uninsured. Next slide. All right, so let's dive into the Mental Health Services Act. Next slide. So the Mental Health Services Act was a ballot initiative passed in 2004, and it was really an unprecedented piece of legislation in California for several reasons. Uh, prior to this time, there was really a growing recognition that public mental health services was seriously underfunded. This is when many more people were uninsured, so there were many more people seeking safety net services. We just didn't have a lot of money. We had the Medi-Cal dollars and some realignment dollars, but there was a desire to put even more resources in. The question was, how can we be better as a state to help people lead better lives? And MHSA is vital to helping address disparities in communities of color, because it is based on the idea that we need to develop a whole other community system that focuses on the needs of underserved individuals and local communities, a much broader view than just specialty mental health services for people with Medi-Cal. Um, and so you'll see in the right column, there's a wide spectrum of services that are available through the Mental Health Services Act. MHSA is vital to addressing disparities in communities of color because it actually requires all county mental health plans to engage communities in prioritizing what, serves, what services need to be funded. This is often referred to the MHSA community planning process. Um, and so you know, opportunities to engage in the community planning process will be talked at greater length during an upcoming webinar that we will be hosting called Policy Strategies for Reducing Behavioral Health Disparities. And that webinar will be on December 6th, which we hope you can all join. Um, lastly, MHSA also established the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission. Next slide. So as you can see, uh, MHSA also established this Oversight and Accountability Commission, and they are responsible for the oversight of MHSA. You will often hear people refer to this commission as the OAC. Um, the second thing to note about this graph is that the Mental Health Services Act is primarily administered, again, by county mental health plans. So as you can see, MHSA was similarly carved out into the county mental health plan, very much like specialty mental health services. 
The OEC has broad policy oversight and some fiscal oversight over the innovations component of MHSA and some prevention stuff as well. Um, in other words, the OEC has general oversight of the implementation, but unfortunately, for the most part, they actually don't approve that many things for counties. So one important flag for you to note is that the Department of Healthcare Services, which you see over on the left, they're actually the ones that have fiscal responsibility for making sure that counties are spending the funds prudently. And the money goes straight from the Treasury to the counties. That's also important for you to know. Um, so while the OEC and DHCS does have oversight over what counties are doing, there's a level of accountability that continues to go missing. For example, neither oversight entities collect any data on the outcomes of MHSA programs to improve quality. This is especially relevant for communities of color and is something we should work towards. Counties don't get everything perfect and there are clear opportunities for improvement at the local level. Next slide. All right, so the Affordable Care Act. Um, the Affordable Care Act, next slide. It expanded benefits. Um, and it specifically expanded benefits under Medi-Cal Managed Care and fee-for-service. So um, in 2014, mental health benefits were expanded in Medi-Cal Managed Care and fee-for-service, and they became responsible for mild to moderate benefits. This law recognized that managed care plans and fee-for-service providers, not primary care doctors, are responsible for treating people's mild to moderate mental health conditions. The other important thing to note about this is that the 2014 Act established and recognized that there's actually a need to coordinate care between county mental health and Medi-Cal managed care, especially to meet the needs of people with higher levels of need. And so this is still a relatively new benefit for people. Uh, it's a new responsibility and it's something we wanna think more about. Um, but what's important for all of you to know is that we do know that there is low utilization of this mild to moderate benefit, and health, but health plans continue to get paid for it. Next slide. So just another graphic that shows um, how this benefit is structured. Next slide. Click, click. All right, so we have talked about specialty mental health services, the Mental Health Services Act, and Medi-Cal Managed Care Fee-for-Service Expanded Benefits. My point with this graphic is that there is absolutely no reason why anyone with any level of need can't get services, can't get the services they need in our public mental health system. Next slide. Back, please, back one slide. Thank you. Even with the spectrum of services, we still know that California's mental health system is complicated and challenging to navigate. So we will now, now talk about how to navigate referrals. Next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned, we know that communities of color have historically been unserved, underserved, and inappropriately served by California's mental health system. But what does this actually mean on the ground? What does it mean to go unserved, underserved, or inappropriately served? Here's just a simple graphic of what it actually means for these populations to go unserved. It means that they're not getting any screenings, there are no referrals, they're not getting any treatment, they are completely left out of our safety net. Underserved, this means that they're getting some level of service, but it may not be to the full need. They might not get the language that they prefer, prefer or in the location they prefer. Do they prefer services in the home or at the office or with the adequate referrals for basic needs, right? Inappropriately served. This means that the person or the client may have received a diagnosis, but it really does not reflect their experience or symptoms. It means they may have been mistreated or traumatized by a therapist or it may simply mean that they are continuing services but feel misunderstood. Um, communities of color face many of these barriers. Next slide. Click, click. All right, so um, this is why it's so essential that your organization has referral tools to help you navigate public mental health services. By law, every county mental health plan is required to at least have a toll-free number 
It's so important that you know your county's toll-free number because there are many situations where clients would prefer to call themselves when they are ready for services, or it may be that they need support in a crisis where you can no longer wait. However, for communities of color, contacting a 1-800 number is very intimidating due to concerns about privacy, trust, information, and um, safety. Um, which is also why it's really important that your organization has a strong referral system, one that incorporates lots of documentation and tracking of forms. And this is an example of a referral form that's used by um, an outreach coordinator in Solano County. Um, whether your organization has created their own referral form or the county mental health plan has provided one, the use of a referral form is a great way to document the necessary information and also provides you an important opportunity to advocate for clients and track referrals. Next slide. Um, so even with referral tools, even with referral tools, there are many breakdowns that can prevent the navigation of a referral from successfully moving from just a referral to assessment to treatment. This is a simplified version, but let's move through this process slowly to identify all the breakdowns. So let's start at the first box here at the top, place or program. A place or program could be an after-school program, an immigration organization, legal aid, a home visitation program, schools, and so on. A person or a client who is connected to a place or program is already facing an opportunity for a referral. But as people on the webinar know, many people um, in communities of color are not even connected to a place or program yet because of the realities of their lives or social isolation. Um, so in communities of color, these staff who are working in places or programs, you have enormous influence. You're in the best position to start noticing risk factors. Uh, through this lens, you will encounter people who may show signs of needing mental health care. And that staff member can either formally or informally screen them for services. Oftentimes, staff do not have formal or informal tools to recognize and refer people to mental health care. And this is where you may encounter the first breakdown. This is a breakdown in informal or formal tools that are not there, which may be compounded by the stigma that that person is experiencing. But let's say you do recognize the signs and have some tools at your disposal to initiate referral. Perhaps you have good intuition, you have some basic training, your organization has some tools. Then the next hurdle is where do you refer? Do you refer directly to the county mental health line? Do you know of contractors in your county that provide services? This is where you may encounter a second breakdown. There's a breakdown if the resources aren't there or you're not aware of them. So let's say you do refer to a person, uh, but let's say you do refer a person. Say you figured this out, you called around and you found a place that could provide services. You call them and their intake person says, yes, we, we do provide services. And they tell you, um, yeah, the client, they just need to come in for an assessment. This is where, unfortunately, you may encounter another breakdown. Does your client have a consistent phone number? Can they get to the county or subcontractor? What if the first available appointment doesn't work for that person, right? There's a breakdown if the accessibility isn't there. So let's say you do get them an assessment. They make it to the office and complete the assessment. The clinician who is assigned to you successfully completes it, usually, and usually that can take about an hour to two hours. Um, they, the assessment, for, for your knowledge, is, it's usually a verbal assessment. They might ask you direct questions about your family, about your living situation, about your relationships, and so on. Um, but this is still where you may encounter another breakdown. Does your client feel comfortable with that person? Right? The breakdown can happen if the clinician doesn't have a cultural or linguistic understanding of, their client, of the client's experience. And so there is a breakdown if the cultural and linguistic, co linguistic competency isn't there, which is all about accessibility. Um, so moving on to the next clip, yeah, thank you. Lack of competency, right? And so, oh, if you could go back. And so all that to say, um, you know, one single referral is simply not enough. We need to advocate for clients at every stage of the way so that we can ensure 
what is ultimately the goal, continuity of care. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at this from the perspective of um, when a referral process is functioning effectively. What protocols and processes does your organiza organization need to put in place to address the breakdown? Um, your organization should have some screening tools available to help staff identify risk factors. Um, one important thing to note, however, is that do not underestimate the power of the relationship between the place or program and client. Uh, this is particularly true in communities of color where trust and safety with a place or program can help facilitate their openness to additional resources, even without an official screening tool. However, screening tools do help staff feel confident and also help prevent clients from falling through the cracks. So the addition of screening tools is an important opportunity to provide training to staff. This will help to move that client from um, ambiguity to consent. Uh, and documentation of consent is essential for all clients, but especially in communities with a long history of no consent. So if we are able to screen a client and they consent, then the next step is to actually refer them to a place for services, a county or contractor. Remember, the county mental health plan may provide all the services themselves, or they may contract out those services to a community-based organization. And it is therefore essential that they have a handful of relationships with county mental health plans or contracted providers, your organization. This will help lead to a referral. Click. All right, so we're not done. The referral is not complete. The client needs to actually show up for their assessment. Remember, it is not your job to assess whether the person is eligible for specialty mental health services or other MHSA services, like prevention and early intervention. This is the role of an assessment. But for this to happen, it's important you do a needs assessment. Does your client have transportation? What are their work hours? Do they need language interpretation services? These are all issues you should be noting in your referral. We're talking about mental health services here, but as all of you know, an equitable referral requires that we actually help communities of color access services. This will help achieve linkage. So next, <clears throat> your client has now completed the assessment, right? They've made it to the office, um, and the county has determined what services that they're eligible for. Um, again, we need to continue to assess for accessibility. Would the client prefer services in the home, also known as field-based services in the, by the mental health system? Or would the client prefer center-based services, services in the office? We need to do these ongoing assessments to ensure that the referral moves from just an assessment to treatment. Next, we need to follow up. If our client is already connected to your place or program, we need to follow up with them. Do they feel comfortable with the services they are receiving? Have they encountered any challenges? Do they need support advocating for themselves? Change in situation is common in people's lives, which is why we need to follow up and ask, have their needs changed? Does your place or program need to contact the mental health organization and help advocate for the client? Continuing to continuous follow-up will help to address any issues that may come up and ultimately lead to continuity of care. And continuity of care will lead to change in people's lives. Next slide. So as you can see, um, there is an opportunity for breakdowns at many stages of navigation. Um, and there are cases where people have their mental health rights violated. What's important to note is that all clients have mental health rights. In fact, there are consumer protections in healthcare for all people who need to access mental health. County operated mental health are required to meet state and federal requirements and provide necessary, culturally competent care. County mental health plans are also required to provide oral interpretation services in threshold languages at key points of contact, maintain a 24-7 toll-free access line, which we talked about earlier, in all languages spoken, and provide timely access to services. But despite these requirements, we know that communities of color continue to have consistently lower mental health penetration rates and less access to specialty mental health services. So these are an important area of advocacy that CPEN continues to monitor. Next slide. Great, 
so we have gotten through all of our slides. Um, thank you all so much for joining this Public Mental Health Services 101 webinar. We hope that you can all join us for the next webinar series. We have uh, three more coming up and we'll send out dates for that as well as the information from this webinar. And let's take a little bit of time for some questions. We'll take a pause here to see what questions have been asked. Oh, and we have our quick poll to take as well too. So how confident do you feel about navigating the public mental health services system now? Okay, so we'll take a, a quick moment until the poll is done. Okay, well, we're, while we're getting um, results, um, you know, we're taking in questions from you, so please put your questions in the question box. Um, but the one that that um, we have right now is um, Carolina. You mentioned that you know you worked in direct service and you worked with communities of color. And so while in that you know in that position, what were some, some challenges that you know you noticed or you experienced over the years of doing that work? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, important that we, oh, I was just muted. All right, so um, Mihai, do you want to repeat your question? Yeah, I'm sorry, you're muted. So um, I asked the question for um, Carolina, you know, her capacity when she had the role of working in direct service, you know, what were some of the challenges and um, that you experienced doing that work? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's the question I asked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. I think the biggest challenge is that most organizations struggle with the capacity to help their clients navigate referrals. It's very uncommon for there to be one dedicated staff person that can help navigate referrals. So oftentimes advocates are doing this work and it's going unaccounted for, and it's very laborious work. So what I would say um, is that it's really important that you have conversations at your organizations, if this hasn't already happened, about the need to have one dedicated person that is managing referrals. Great, thank you so much. Um, and we actually got one question from the audience, and it's uh, it says, "Can you share with us um, examples of mild versus moderate?" Mm, that's a great question. Well, I am not a licensed clinician, so I could not make that complete assessment. But what I will say is um, that typically um, it's a it's a pretty small distinction, um, and it typically is indicated by how severe the person's symptoms are. So for example, you might inquire, you might use an assessment tool that inquires about their lack of sleep or poor appetite. And so a mo someone that is experiencing more mild symptoms might say that they have poor appetite or poor sleep one to two times a week, while a person with more moderate symptoms might say that they're experiencing it three to four times a week, and they may also be having poor concentration. So they're very subtle differences, but I think that um, for your knowledge, it is important to have some general understanding um, of what mental health symptoms are. Thank you. I think that's really helpful when, um, you know, for the audience members that are working in all different sectors, um, but we're all working um, and being accountable to our community. So that's really helpful to know. Um, and the second question we have from uh, the audience is, does every county have a formal referrals form. 
Mm, that's a great question. Yes, every county, I don't believe every county is required by law to have a formal referral form, but every county, in my experience, has at least one referral form that people can use. Again, it's really important for documentation purposes to have one, so yes. Okay, and another question here is, do health IT systems communicate about referrals? Mm, yeah, this is a really big barrier that comes up because of HIPAA laws, um, which are about patient-protected information. Um, so some counties have developed agreements to share information where they can communicate through health IT systems about referrals. Um, oftentimes, you'll hear about this system as an e-consult system. Um, which is really, really great, and um, definitely you should inquire about whether or not this is available in your county or something you want to advocate for. Um, but there are counties that do not have any communication pathways between entities or their health IT system. Thank you. So if you are a community-based organization or maybe you are an advocate, how can you initiate conversations or relationships or connections with your local mental health department? Mm. And maybe you didn't have a relationship with them before. You know, maybe you've not traditionally done a lot of mental health related work, but you know that your community is really needing um, the services or you're recognizing risk factors. Um, maybe you are managing those programs or you're doing outreach and enrollment or you're a legal um, organization and you're mm -hmm. noticing these risk factors, especially in the political climate that we're in, um, mm -hmm. how can you initiate conversations with your mental health department mm -hmm. to, to be connected more to these mm -hmm. services and, and get closer to it? Mm -hmm. What can you do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can do it. Um, every county does have stakeholder, public stakeholder groups that you can attend to learn more about what's happening in your county mental health system. Um, you know, I'm kind of old fashioned and I cold, you know, when I was doing this work and interested in developing relationships with the county, I would cold call and set up meetings um, to, you know, hear from them, what are the referral pathways? And then when I would have cases that um, weren't functioning well, then I would go back to my contact and say, I'm having trouble with this referral. So I think it's really important that you have at least one relationship with somebody from the county mental health system who is an ally for your work. Um, and sometimes you might encounter folks that are newer, right, because we have lots of turnover in the county mental health system and are learning themselves. I often found that when there were new staff in the county mental health system, it was really a great opportunity to collaborate because there was a parallel process in the learning and a commitment to the work. Um, and so, you know, I would encourage organizations to think about who in, a, in their team can be sort of a liaison or an advocate with the county mental health system to make sure that people are getting services. Thank you, that's really, really helpful. Um, for all of us working in communities of color to know who your um, contact is at the mental health department. Um, so we have two questions. The questions are flowing in, thank you. Um, so here, what is the threshold the county must have in their MHSA funds? And it is, uh, there's actually two parts to that question. Do, do they need to keep a certain amount in MHSA funds? What if they're not spending the funds? Mm -hmm. So the questions are, what is the threshold a county must have in their MHSA fund? Do they need to keep a certain amount in MHSA funds? What if they're not spending mm. the money? Yeah, that's a great question. There's been a lot of attention on this issue in the past year. Uh, so for folks on the call, um, there was an audit this past February that found that county mental health departments were sitting on millions of unspent dollars. Um, and actually a huge bulk of those dollars were intended to go directly to services but also a huge part of those funds were in reserve. Um, and so counties are allowed to keep certain amounts in reserve um, in case of a rainy day or um, if the revenue for the, from the millionaire's tax is not coming in as consistently as they anticipated. Um, so typically the funds were um, historically supposed to revert back to the state. 
Um, but they did pass a law this past year called AB 114, which allowed counties to hold on to those funds and develop plans for spending. Um, and that law um, is only in effect for a certain period of time. So um, if counties do not continue to spend their funds, then they will be required to have them revert back to the state. Okay. And I believe that um, everyone can go to their county mental health website and download the plan, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think that's you know a helpful flag for you all. If you're curious about your county's um, MHSA plans, you can easily go on the website and find out. Great. Great. Okay, so we actually, uh, there's no more questions, and uh, I see that we're a little bit early, 11.51, but that's totally okay, and I think that we're okay to end the webinar slightly earlier and give you back 10 minutes of your, 10 minutes of your day. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this webinar. Um, again, the, the video, the webinar will be recorded and be available to you. And um, like we were saying before, this is a series. And so we have three more webinars that are coming. Um, so just flag for you, our second webinar is going to be about the California Reducing Disparities Project, like I mentioned before. Um, and that's going to be on October 25th, 11th to 12th. Feel free to go on our website to register. And our third webinar will be on substance use prevention and treatment community-oriented practices. So we have excellent um, you know, executive directors from various different organizations that have been working in substance use pre uh, prevention and treatment for decades and decades. And there's going to be just a wealth of information and, and historical context on substance use prevention and treatment. So it'll be a really good one. And I know that if you're on this call, you're probably very interested in policy. And at CPEN, we're a policy organization, so we cannot have a webinar without that conversation. And so the last webinar of the series, we're going to end um, this work uh, with policy strategies for reducing behavioral health disparities, especially in communities of color. So, you know, talking about how can you engage in counter level behavioral health uh, systems and how can we expand access and what kind of policy strategies can we all be engaged in. So, that would be on December 6th. And I hope to see all of you in all of our webinars. Um, go to cpen.org and register um, for these webinars. So, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Carolina, for your um, amazing teaching. And thank you, all of you, for joining the webinar today. Thank you. Have a great day.